There is only unfeeling, non-conscious matter on the most fundamental levels of our universe. It's not like anything for an electron. There's no feeling or sensation, no emotion, no qualitative experience at all, of any kind. So follow the plot of emergence that science has pieced together from the most fundamental levels of the universe to the most highly emergent levels. If we're starting with subatomic particles, they combine to make atoms, which combine to make molecules, which combine to make cells and organisms, and so on, up the scale. From physics to chemistry, up to microbiology, all the way to sociology and economics. Nothing new is being added at any point in this upward journey. Every level is reducible to the level beneath it. Chemistry is just another way of talking about physics when you zoom out a bit. But at some point, some of this matter becomes conscious. We go from the fundamental levels, which are made up of non-conscious physical material that has no subjective experience, and at some point, we get conscious physical material that has a subjective experience. This is the hard problem of consciousness. The phrase, hard problem of consciousness, was coined by the philosopher David Chalmers. He wanted to draw attention to the question of why consciousness arises, rather than all the various functions our minds carry out. The question of how memory is physically stored would be in the category of easy problem, not because it's a cakewalk to figure out, but because it's a problem of a different kind than the one Chalmers wants us to think about. The same goes for how our brain does anything. Any physical description of how we walk, how we talk, that is, any third-person view of how our brain is behaving during some activity. This excludes, however, any subjective component. Patrons who listened to the Mind and Cosmos episode will be familiar with this distinction between descriptions that are behavioral or external versus internal, objective versus subjective, first-person versus third-person, and which kind of description the sciences are designed to give us. Many neuroscientists and philosophers, pushing back against the hard problem, have pointed out that the situation we're currently in feels like the state of affairs biologists and philosophers were in prior to our current understanding of microbiology. People thought life could never be explained in materialistic, mechanistic terms. There were many subscribers to an idea called vitalism, where a life force, or Elan Vital, was postulated to explain the difference between living systems and dead systems. Living systems have all these interesting, unique properties. They can reproduce, they can repair themselves, they can metabolize, they can move around and do stuff that you wouldn't expect from a dead collection of matter. And that's why we needed Elan Vital, a non-physical substance or force, to make sense of the fact that life is so different from non-life. But once we learned more about the mechanisms of life, there was no more need for Elan Vital. All those interesting properties of life are reducible to their chemical activity. You can explain everything in biology in terms of chemistry, the more fundamental field in the picture of emergence. So it was a compositional fallacy to assert that these life processes couldn't emerge from the workings of the component parts of life. And I used to think the hard problem was also a compositional fallacy. Sure, the unique properties of life don't exist on the levels below biology, but that doesn't mean they couldn't emerge, any more than the property of niftiness couldn't emerge. I mean, some things are nifty, But that doesn't mean niftiness has to be there at the bottom, or else it never would have emerged. Niftiness is real, even though there's no such thing as niftiness until you move up the scale of emergence. It's no different than tables and chairs, or fluid motion, none of which exist on lower levels. There appears to be something new coming into existence with fluidity. It wasn't there before, but get a bunch of molecules together, and there it is. So is consciousness like life or fluid motion? That's the question. How analogous are conscious properties to the properties of life, or fluidity? I want to take a minor detour to think about the problem of other minds. How do you know anyone else is conscious besides yourself? You know your mind exists, but what about others? You can observe the behavior of others, but behavior on its own doesn't guarantee mentality. Whether you're observing the behavior of their facial expressions to figure out what their mind is feeling, or the behavior of their neurons, and how they're firing, you're not experiencing their mind. You can only observe the external behavior of matter, not experience the internal properties of that matter, should any exist. And I'm not a solipsist. It's obviously the simplest explanation that mentality is present in others, since there's no reason to suppose you're special. What are the odds that you're the only conscious one and everyone else is a zombie? If someone is crying or laughing, it's probably analogous to when you're crying or laughing. 
you have all the same behavioral indicators that they do, and you know that you have a mind. But demonstrating that other minds exist to the same level of certainty that your mind exists is not possible. What I'm trying to establish here is there's a difference between internally and externally observable properties. We know matter has both. It obviously has externally viewable properties, and it has internally viewable properties. Your brain's neurons firing a certain way is an example of the former. Feeling happy is an example of the latter. If you believe you're made of nothing but matter, then you must agree that matter has properties that are external and internal. Consciousness is not an externally, publicly, objectively viewable property, even when we're pretty sure it's there, as with other people. All the supposed analogies of physical properties emerging, like temperature or metabolism or fluidity, are not subjective properties. Every other example offered is an external, public, objectively viewable by a third party example, whereas qualitative experience is none of those things. So drawing an analogy between consciousness and fluidity or metabolism will always fall flat with me. This is where I want to re-clarify that I'm a physicalist and a monist. I'm not a substance dualist. I don't believe in any supernatural. I think there's nothing but matter up here in my brain. Consciousness is a property of that matter. I can't observe your mind. I can only observe mine. I can observe a huge number of external, physical, objectively viewable correlates of consciousness. Your body language, your facial expressions, the way your neurons are firing, the composition of your bloodstream, and so on. But I can't observe your mind directly. Only you can. Your mind is not objectively or externally or behaviorally viewable. I could have all the information in the world about the arrangement of atoms that is you, and I still wouldn't be able to experience your mind for you. This is true regardless of your view of consciousness. So hopefully we can agree that consciousness is not really like other things that exist in the universe, which is one big reason all the analogies intended to undermine the hard problem are totally unconvincing to me. What I'm about to say will make more sense as we go along. I just need to clarify a couple things at this point. Even though there's a distinction between internal and external properties, I accept that many subjective properties can emerge, as long as we're talking about weak emergence. What it's like changes as you change the arrangement of matter, but that it's like something has to be a given. In order for contents of consciousness to emerge, like selfhood, personality, desires, emotions, etc., there has to be something for them to emerge out of. Just like there has to be matter for matter to evolve and emerge into chemistry and biology, there has to be subjectivity for the various subjective properties in question to emerge. To say subjectivity itself can emerge, would be an example of strong emergence, getting something from nothing. It would be like getting chemistry without any subatomic particles. You just went from nothing to chemistry, without chemistry being reducible to something beneath it. Right, so I think then its objection is that it seems ridiculous to explain niftiness by saying just that everything is nifty. Hmm. Uh, but I think there's a big difference between niftiness and consciousness, namely that there doesn't seem to be anything very particularly irreducible about niftiness. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what niftiness is, but uh, <laughs> it seems... cool and useful in a kind of um, uh, unexpected and uh, novel way. Okay, like, yeah. So that... Like a, a bottle opener that is also a hammer is nifty. <laughs> oh, oh okay. there you go. Oh, fantastic. So it seems like right there you're, you're like on track towards a reduction of niftiness yeah, to, okay. to just like a collection <laughs> of parts that are not by themselves nifty mm. and it's not like i will have an objection to that and say no there is this like essence of niftiness that you're not capturing but with consciousness when you explain it in terms of just physical parts like physical particles that are fundamentally non-conscious mm. organized in some complex way it seems like that's going to leave out something that's essential to consciousness it doesn't really capture uh, or ex seem to explain the what it is likeness or right. the subjectivity or the, the distinct way in which um, experiences are qualitative. And for that reason, As I mentioned in the first panpsychism episode, I didn't really move past realizing that substance dualism was wrong for many years. To quote David Chalmers, I call my argument the Hegelian argument for panpsychism because it takes the dialectical form often attributed to Hegel, the form of thesis, antithesis, Synthesis. 
In my Hegelian argument, the thesis is materialism, the antithesis is dualism, and the synthesis is panpsychism, which captures the virtues of both and the vices of neither. End quote. The main thing that changed for me over the first few months of looking into panpsychism was that I went from thinking the hard problem was a non-problem to being convinced that it is a real problem. There were two questions that were crucial for me. Is strong emergence possible? And is consciousness truly something new that appeared? Those who don't give much weight to the hard problem argue that we know higher level emergent properties don't have to be present in the lower level building blocks of that thing. A single molecule of water isn't fluid but that doesn't mean that a collection of water molecules don't have the emergent property of fluidity. A single atom isn't red, but that doesn't mean that a collection of atoms can't have the property of redness. If this also applies to consciousness, that would make the hard problem just a compositional fallacy. In other words, the emergence of consciousness is an example of weak emergence, and defenders of the hard problem are mistaking it for an example of strong emergence, which is why they think it's a problem. We've been throwing around the concept of emergence quite a bit, so we should take a moment to discuss what it is in a bit more detail. Emergence is easily one of the most elegantly simple models ever developed. It's composed of few parts, but it explains a lot without losing nuance, which is what you want in an explanatory model. Anyone can understand the basics of it, and it unifies all the sciences and creates a coherent picture of reality. It breaks down illusory boundaries between disciplines. Emergence is a prominent feature of my worldview. It's not that I have something unique and profound to say about it. I just use it, I'm tempted to say, every day. It's such a powerful explanatory framework, and so clarifying when you're trying to make sense of the natural world and unify our knowledge into one picture that hangs together. I really don't understand why this isn't in the public consciousness, since it's such a powerful concept. To quote Sean Carroll, the physicist who introduced me to emergence, I think emergence is absolutely central to how naturalists should think about the world and how we should find room for higher level concepts from tables to free will in a way compatible with the scientific image, but weak emergence, not strong emergence. Weak emergence is simply the idea that there are multiple theories, languages, vocabularies, ontologies that we can use to usefully describe the world, each appropriate at different levels of coarse graining and precision. I think emergence serves as a paradigm for how we can connect the manifest image to the scientific image. End quote. Sometimes emergence gets a bad reputation, however, because it's often used irresponsibly in a hand-waving manner to explain away some phenomenon. For me, a lot of confusion can be dispelled by distinguishing between weak and strong emergence. Weak emergence is what I use. I don't think strong emergence is a thing. Strong emergence is the whole being truly greater than the sum of its parts, not reducible to the level beneath it. Weak emergence is simply smaller objects or processes interacting to create larger scale objects or processes. Subatomic particles combine to make atoms, which combine to make molecules, which combine to make organisms, and so on up the scale. Nothing truly new is being added. You're simply zooming in and out arbitrarily. You can analyze a biological organism as such, or as a complex chemical reaction, or as a complex collection of atoms. These are all just different ways of talking about the same thing. It's just that these different ways of talking about might be more or less useful depending on your purposes. This doesn't require that we add anything really new to our picture of the world. Just different levels of analysis or different ways of talking about the same underlying object slash process. Strong emergence, on the other hand, is highly dubious. In strong or radical emergence, higher-level phenomena are not reducible, even in principle, to lower-level phenomena. Strong emergence is when something truly new comes up. We go up that same scale of emergence, and then a truly new ingredient appears. The whole is actually greater than the sum of its parts. It's crucial to keep this distinction between strong emergence versus weak emergence. Though strong emergence doesn't make any sense, it seems to be the implicit assumption of many materialists. If I'm supposed to believe that consciousness doesn't exist on more fundamental levels of matter, then here's what I'm supposed to believe. You combine quarks to eventually get atoms, you combine atoms to eventually get cells, you combine cells to get more complex organisms, and all the while nothing new is being added. Physics and chemistry and biology are just different ways of talking about collections of matter. Then, once we get to some point along this scale, 
that it's like something to be suddenly pops into existence. It wasn't there before, and now it is. We arranged a bunch of non-conscious atoms, and out came consciousness. As I mentioned last episode, whether it's like something to be is a binary thing. It is either like something to exist, or it isn't. It can't kind of be like something, or seem to be like something. It either is or it isn't. And here we have to make a choice. We either have to go the way of Dan Dennett and claim that consciousness isn't really real, or what it seems to be. Or we can be realists about consciousness and claim that strong emergence is possible. But if you're a realist about conscious experience, that it's like something to be, and you don't think radical emergence is possible, panpsychism seems to be the only option left for you. You either have to become a dualist, or claim that consciousness is an illusion, like Dennett, or claim that radical emergence is a reasonable thing to believe in. But strong emergence honestly seems like getting something from nothing. You might as well believe the magician is really pulling a rabbit out of his hat that wasn't there before and suddenly appeared. I think weak emergence is the only reasonable version to believe in. Strong emergence seems impossible. In fact, it seems rationally incoherent. If you're not a dualist and you want to avoid panpsychism, you either have to deny the reality of conscious experience, you have to be an eliminativist and say that consciousness is a sort of illusion, or you have to accept radical emergence. But I think the more reasonable step would be to posit a rudimentary form of consciousness there at the bottom. So all we have is the far more reasonable weak emergence. Then there is no hard problem. I was already a materialist monist, and I accepted the reality of consciousness. So for me, the explicit rejection of strong emergence was a huge moment of transition. I actually think the hard problem of consciousness is a manufactured problem. If you agree with the idea that consciousness is the one thing that can't be an illusion, that it's like something to be, and you believe you're made of material and nothing more, then our epistemological starting point is somewhat different than we ordinarily imagine. If you're made of matter and nothing more, and you know that you're conscious, it follows that the only thing you actually know with complete certainty about the nature of matter is that it's sometimes conscious. That's your epistemological starting point. The only thing you know about matter is that it's sometimes conscious. So why are we generally so sure that there is such a thing as matter for which it's not like anything to be? Why do we believe in non-conscious matter in the first place? The hard problem only materializes when we assume there is such a thing as matter for which it's not like anything to be. Because we have to transition impossibly from unconscious to conscious matter in a feat of strong emergence. But we don't actually know there is such a thing to begin with. So why create this unsolvable problem? This problem requires us to either give up the reality of consciousness, the route that Dan Dennett goes, or it requires us to accept radical emergence, which is implicitly the route most other materialists go. But strong emergence doesn't make any sense, we'd essentially be giving up on the rational intelligibility of the universe. As Bertrand Russell pointed out, the only thing we actually know about matter, with absolute certainty, is that it's sometimes conscious. So the burden is to explain why we should suppose there is such a thing as non-conscious matter, matter for which it's not like anything to be. I'm not saying it can't be done, I'm just saying it has to be done. Positing an electron with some rudimentary form of consciousness is ultimately unfalsifiable, but so is positing an electron without any internal qualia. They're both unfalsifiable. So what is our reason for supposing that they don't have any form of experience? That they're not talking to us? Would you expect them to? Panpsychism certainly doesn't predict that they would. If panpsychism is true, human consciousness is an exceedingly rare form in the universe. Most conscious subjects have no memory, no emotion, no sense of self. All that emerges from brain activity. If panpsychism is true, it's like something to be for an electron, but its experience doesn't include any of the contents of consciousness that we enjoy. Everything about you can be changed by changing your brain and body, your personality, your desires, your language. Everything about being human emerges from the processes of your brain and body. What I'm saying is that while those things are reducible, language, personality, desires, etc., and can emerge from lower levels, experience itself would never have emerged if it wasn't already there. All the contents of consciousness humans enjoy emerge weakly. They evolve within the scheme of weak emergence. 
you arrange a bunch of conscious matter in a particular way, what it's like for the matter changes. But that it's like something was already there. That's why changing the arrangement of matter changes the contents of consciousness. What it's like. Everything about you can be changed by changing your brain and body. To return to Russell's point, the only thing we actually know about matter, with certainty, is that it's sometimes conscious. That is our epistemological starting point regarding the intrinsic nature of matter. This doesn't mean it's unreasonable to believe in non-conscious matter, but what's the evidence for the existence of non-conscious matter? If the question is about our belief formation, then the answer is easy. We believe in non-conscious matter because rocks don't talk to us. Matter doesn't seem conscious to us intuitively because it doesn't activate our theory of mind. Our theory of mind is our psychological ability to attribute conscious states to chunks of matter out there in physical space. When I see your mouth and face twisted up in a particular way, I immediately think you're happy. A different way, I think you're sad. Tone of voice, body language, and so on, they all give me external indicators of your internal state. Non-human animals have this ability as well. It's crucial for survival to know how the organisms around you are feeling. Theory of mind is an evolved psychological module. It's not a consciousness detector, in the sense that it can determine for sure that consciousness is present. Our theory of mind is not like a metal detector for consciousness. Someone can be locked in, for example, and we can't tell they're conscious. You can just walk right by a sufficiently camouflaged person without knowing there's a conscious creature present. For many people, their theory of mind isn't even activated for non-human animals. This was another reason I brought up the problem of other minds. The point is that we can't just detect consciousness if it's there. We rely entirely on physical indicators like body language and tone of voice and so on. Our theory of mind is the cause of our belief formation here. Why create so many problems for ourselves by supposing the existence of non-conscious matter? It's actually less epistemically responsible, and it creates the hard problem, which forces us to give up either the reality of consciousness or to accept the possibility of radical emergence. Our intuitions are the real reason we think there is such a thing as non-conscious matter, matter for which it's not like anything to be. And we have no reason to trust these intuitions. They evolved to help us survive and reproduce as social animals, not to provide us with a metal detector but for consciousness. The only thing we actually know about matter, with absolute certainty, is that it's sometimes conscious. And the main reason I'm supposed to take it as a matter of course that matter isn't conscious is because of my theory of mind which we know with certainty misfires and fails to fire in a range of circumstances? We created an unsolvable problem for no good reason at all. It springs from an epistemically irresponsible starting point that we know matter is non-conscious, a reliance on a human theory of mind that is not a consciousness detector, and forces us to either accept radical emergence, become dualists, or deny the reality of experience. To accept radical emergence, is essentially to give up on the rational intelligibility of the universe, and to go the route that Dennett goes and deny the reality of consciousness, as Galen Strawson puts it, is the silliest claim that has ever been made. It's to deny the only thing, really the only thing, that we know with complete certainty. Why create this problem for ourselves? Nothing is gained and so much is lost. Here's the philosopher and psychologist William James on the subject of consciousness arising from non-conscious matter. Quote, The demand for continuity has over large tracts of science proved itself to possess truly prophetic power. We ought, therefore, sincerely to try every possible mode of conceiving the dawn of consciousness so that it may not appear equivalent to the eruption into the universe of a new nature, non-existent until then. Merely to call consciousness nascent will not serve our turn. It is true that the word signifies not yet quite born, and so seems to form a bridge between existence and non-entity. But that is a verbal quibble. The fact is that discontinuity comes in if a new nature comes in at all. The quantity of the latter is quite immaterial. The girl in Midshipman Easy could not excuse the illegitimacy of her child by saying it was a very small one. And consciousness, however small, is an illegitimate birth in any philosophy that starts without it and yet professes to explain all facts by continuous evolution. If evolution is to work smoothly, consciousness in some shape must have been present at the very origin of things. Accordingly, we find the more clear-sighted evolutionary philosophers 
are beginning to posit it there. Each atom of the nebula, they suppose, must have an aboriginal atom of consciousness linked with it, and just as the material atoms have formed bodies and brains by massing themselves together, so the mental atoms, by an analogous process of aggregation, have fused into those larger consciousnesses which we know in ourselves and supposed to exist in our fellow animals. Thank you for listening. I've been Emerson Green, and I'll talk to you next time.